Are you a scaling SaaS founder? Ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel Podcast, where our sales cycle moves faster than light. You blink and you're a customer. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I help B2B SaaS founders like you scale from seven figures, which is good, to eight and nine figures, which is outstanding. Together, we supercharge revenue growth, create premium valuation, and craft a business you're proud of and a life of impact and freedom that you love. Growing up, did you ever take one of those epic cross-country family road trips? Or maybe you've done it with your own kids. I had a client who did that this summer. It was him and his wife and three kids coast to coast in an RV for a month. It's like, whoa, dude, you are brave. They had an incredible time. Very cool to be able to take that much time off as well. Growing up, we did summer vacations, and they were almost all driving. We really didn't fly much of anywhere. And uh, most of them were in a station wagon. How about that? It kind of tells you the time frame. Uh, We did a trip multiple summers in a row from Texas to Colorado. And it's like, hey, it's only 14 hours. And this is before there were devices to keep us entertained and things like that. So we had to make our own fun. And while 14 hours, maybe that sounds long, we were kind of used to that because driving to see grandparents a couple times a year was a 12-hour road trip uh, each way. So it wasn't like 12 hours both ways, but 12 hours one way. My wife and I and our kids have been all over the U.S. together and a fair amount of international travel as well. And they are great travelers. We started when they were pretty young. But there always comes a point when somebody says, you know, are we there yet? And it's cute maybe the first time. About the hundredth time, it's like, you know, I'll trade my spare tire just to make it stop. And yeah, I'm sure maybe you felt that way too. And I remember 22 hours into a, a 31-hour trip. And it's like, I just want to be home, you know, exhausted, uncomfortable, grumpy. Now, are we there yet? A long sales cycle can be that same kind of feel, you know, like, are we there yet? Have they bought yet? Have they signed? I mean, in the, the business world, I mean, this happens all the time. Sales cycles get strung out for weeks, months, quarters. And we want to get to the destination, close the deal, and we want to get there fast. Prospects can really get to be in that same point. They're exhausted. Negotiations are uncomfortable. And you know, sales managers, they get grumpy when deals get stuck in the weeds and just don't move forward. You ever heard of a solution called Gong.io? And those guys are like the, the Waze app for sales. They're optimizing every single turn, avoiding speed bumps. They use AI to analyze sales calls, emails, offering real-time coaching to get deals close faster. Then you can say, I got to be. Yeah, it's like finding a shortcut that shaves hours off a drive or like flying instead of driving. And so optimization is really important. And I think optimization really is the ticket. But most companies get optimization backwards. What I mean by that is they do optimize their sales process, but they do it for themselves, not for the buyer. And yeah, if that's you and you're in that boat, it's not your fault. I fall into that exact same trap. And we have a process, you know, we have things we need to do. We have certain things that we have to get done to move deals to the next stage. And salespeople are thinking about that. You know, I've got to check the boxes. And I get it. But what if we turn that around? And here's how I've come to to think about that. Uh, First is really knowing your buyer. You know, think of it like putting the right playlist together for your road trip. You know, you know what people are going to like on the trip with you. Now, tailor your process to your audience. And they'll engage a lot quicker. You know, what do they need to believe? What do they need to think, feel, experience, and share to feel really, really good about choosing your solution? The sales process, first and foremost, is about them. It's not about you. And that's a really tough thing to think about because we really look at things from our perspective very, very often. The second is to streamline. There's actually a chapter in my book that's about that. It's about engineer for speed and agility. So we want to streamline that process. Every prospect is at a different stage of the journey. And you don't have to recreate the entire roadmap for each one. And often, you know, they're like 70% or further down the road before they even reach out. 
So use tools like Gong and workflows to make sure that you're not missing chances to accelerate that sales process. Build in shortcuts. Not every buyer needs to go through every step and jump through every hoop, so don't make it too difficult for them. The other thing to remember is they don't know your sales process. And to be really honest, most of them don't know their buying process, especially when you think about enterprise. They don't do this all the time. They don't know what they need. They don't know what they don't know. They don't do this all the time and they don't want to be taken advantage of. They don't want some salesperson pulling the wool over their eyes. One of the reasons that they're 70% down the road before they ever reach out. So if they don't understand their buying process, help them. Teach them how to buy. Show them what's important, why it matters. And this doesn't have to be in person. Don't wait for them to reach out to do this. Do it with content, different content at different funnel stages. You know, if you wait for them to reach out, then you know it's too late. Got to do that early. And content is a really, really good way to do that. Think about what it is that they need to know. What do they need to believe? What do they need to I go back to the, the first point? You know, what do they really need to know? What do they need to feel to feel really good about choosing you? And finally, we want to keep them engaged. So imagine you've got like in-car games. You've got an iPad you know, to keep the kids occupied now. You've got a, a deck of cards. You have a coloring book. You know, all the different things that we used to do. Endless snacks. How about that? But basically, whatever it is, make sure that with your prospects, you are keeping the experience fun and informative. Webinars, interactive demos. I mean, heck, you know, even memes can keep the momentum going. Uh, you know, especially if things are, are running a little bit slow. We do that. But add value in every interaction. You know, don't ever say the words, follow it up, check it in, circle in back. No, add value with every single interaction. So we have a process that we walk our SaaS clients through where we build that into their sales process. Really, really important to do that. So it's not, you know, just a lame game of chase, but that you're adding value with every step. You're moving the interaction forward with every single step. So you ready to speed up that sales cycle and transform your prospects into customers? All while avoiding the dreaded, are we there yet? So let's gas up, add a little SaaS fuel today and hit the sales highway. If you could use some help enhancing your buyer journey, check out my book, Small Fish Big Pond, Building a World-Class Business that Swims Circles Around Competitors. Small Fish Big Pond delivers powerful marketing and leadership lessons guaranteed to enhance your marketing message, wrap value around your clients, and guide their buying journey to conclude that your company is the only one for them. It includes step-by-step frameworks, time-tested growth strategies to attract ideal clients, convert them, and then transform them into brand ambassadors. Pick up the print, ebook, or audio today at smallfishbigpond.com, Amazon, or wherever it is you love to get books. All book profits go to charity no matter what format you get. Our founder on Tuesday was Shanif Danani, founder and CEO of Locusive, former co-founder and CEO of Aptio and Tap Commerce. Prior to that, we talked about how companies mine valuable intel out of their data using AI and his journey building multiple successful companies and a few mistakes along the way. And our expert guest last Thursday was visionary serial entrepreneur and idea guy, Eric Holesclaw founding partner and chief strategist at Liger. We talked about how your SaaS company can become known for all the right reasons. If you feel like the world's best kept secret, then that episode is for you. My guest today is Martin Huntbach, director at Jammy Digital, an award-winning SEO and content marketing agency for businesses that aren't afraid to stand out. It's probably you. They do their best work with SaaS companies, helping them to find and retain customers who become super fans of their products. They've also published a best-selling book called Content Fortress that protects business owners from unnecessary stress, helping them to attract their dream clients. Welcome to the show, Martin Huntbach. Hey, Martin. Welcome to SaaS Fuel. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. I am as well. Yeah, you know, tell me the story behind Jammy Digital. How did you become experts in SEO and content marketing? So we always uh, have run web agencies, and we've always done everything. We used to joke that you know we'll build a website, we'll design a logo, we'll you know take your take your bins out, um, you know for uh, for getting clients. But 
obviously I think that's how a lot of companies start, you know, doing everything, trying to find out what they love to do. Yeah. Um, and eventually we um, fell on content. You know, we were struggling to grow our web agency and um, we use content as an avenue in order to reach more people. So we produced long form blog content for our own website and we started to get traffic leads and sales through it. And then eventually we completely transitioned to do content for people, which is what we do now. Clients pay us to get more organic traffic and uh, leads and sales through their website. Uh, so we've eliminated everything that we don't, you know, do and don't believe in. And not saying that's not valuable, but our passion lies in really providing epic SEO content that gets traffic leads and sales, which is pretty much the only thing we do now. That's great. And so what, what are the content goals? I mean, do you think about it by like funnel stage or how do you, how do you put together a campaign, uh, both for SEO, which is, is kind of machines and for human consumption that really shifts beliefs and, and makes people say, you know, this is a solution for me. Yeah. So we always have this debate with SEO experts where they all think about, you know, traffic and, 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 and rankings. We have this belief that every content plan should be different based on what a business's goal is. So for some people, their business goal might be, you know what, we really want to go for funding or we want to, you know, do a, a round of investment raising. So they might look at things like, well, how much organic traffic do we get to our website or how many, what's our churn rate, things like that. And they all have different goals at various different stages. So the content we produce is based on what business goals they have. So we might have some companies saying we desperately need sales right now. So therefore, we have to put a content plan together to help them achieve that particular goal. So there'll be a series of long form blog content that they can then distribute to their audience and really use it to drive sales. And other times it might be we just want to rank for this one keyword because our competitors got that top spot and we better, we're better, our product service is better. And we really want to rank on the number one spot. So then we'll put a content plan together based on what that goal is at that time. But everybody's different um, and it requires a very different uh, you know, approach. It's not um, enough, unfortunately, to just completely rely on uh, keyword ranking tools and, and, and checking search volume and trying to optimize because everything changes. Uh, you know, just because you're getting traffic to your website doesn't mean they're going to convert into leads and sales. So right. you do have to think about the full buyer's journey. You have to think about, you know, awareness right through to purchase and then uh, becoming an advocate. And we've just found that content, the way that we produce content, can actually help stretch right through the whole buyer's uh, journey so that we are picking people up when they are not 100% sure of what the solution will be. And we're, we're coaching them through the buyer's journey so that when someone lands on your website for the first time and they're consuming some content because they've Googled a keyword and you're ranked in the top spot and then they go down that funnel, then they click onto other pieces of content and before you know it, they're signing up to a free trial or becoming a client. It really is important for us to understand a business's, you know, life cycle and how they make money from awareness right through to consideration and purchase. Uh, and that's important for any website and any client that has a service to offer. You know, we've all been on those websites that have just blogs. We just got a WordPress blog or we've just got a, a you know, right. a tool blog and it's just for traffic and, and organic traffic. And let's just create more longer just comparison posts, things like that. But for, for the most part, the people that we work with and the people that will see a return on that investment are people that have a product and service that you can buy, that you can sign up to, subscriptions or big high ticket products, things like that really, that can actually see a return on that investment rather than just hoping that organic traffic is going to lead to you know, ads, for instance, Google AdSense. Um, it's much more product driven and service driven what we do. Sure, sure. And when somebody says, you know, I need my content, you know, I want to create content and I need sales now, how quickly does content deliver that? Is it a short term strategy? Is it long term? Or is it you know, somewhere in between or both or all of the above? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, really, I love this kind of content. And then ironically, it's one of the eight pillars of content that we speak about in our book, which is sales content. Well, that's one of the pillars. And the, the reason that sales content works so well is because when people think about content, they think about, okay, long form blog content, that's educational, that's informative, that's detailed. 
and we just want to be more helpful. Where actually, if you use the same structure with that content in order to help and educate people about what you do, then it can have a massive impact on sales. As an example, when we launch a new product or service in our business or when our clients do, we tend to put together long form blog content that educates people about all the ways that you can work with this company because that's a legitimate question. You know, we're not, not going to create content to, to be salesy. It's not a sales page that we would write. Yeah. It's actually an informative piece of content that allows someone to understand the intricacies of what it would be like to hire your company or to work with you or to, you know, use your tool, for instance. The more detail that you can go into, the more questions that are answered by your potential customers and that helps, you know, uh, retain your clients if you're on a subscription service. And it helps retain because you're just being more open, honest, and transparent about how someone can work with you and the intricacies of your product or service. So as an example, it would be in everything you need to know about our video service or everything you need mm. to know about our brand new survey tool that we've created. Like actually being sense. more yeah, informative about your products and service. People think, oh, I can't talk about my products and service. I just need to educate and help people because that's what Google love. You know, but when someone wants to buy from you, they're done with all the help kind of awareness content. They just want answers to questions so that they can click the <laughs> buy now button and join join up. So uh, we found that you can get sales through that content from having a very open and honest, transparent discussion with all the questions that you get, the common questions, the common misconceptions, and people are just telling people, look, by the way, if you want to ever work with us, you know, these are the services that we offer. Uh, and it's incredibly powerful, especially when you send that directly to your email list and you start to talk about it on LinkedIn and your social media to say, you know, we've been getting a lot of, you know, praise for the amount of helpful content that we're putting out, which is fantastic. But, you know, you can work with us as well. Here's a post about it, like no pressure, but people ask us these questions. So we're going to actually put something together and to, to answer them. And people love that because it's open, honest, and transparent. And you also get to talk about your products and services. So that's why it's one of my favorite pillars in, in our sort of framework because um, it gets sales instantly. And you can also oh, use sales fine. content yeah. to get, yeah, you can also use it when you're about to increase your prices. So if you are making ah. some big changes in your business or in the tool or the product that you offer, you can actually put together some really uh, clever content pieces, which is why our prices are going up. So it's not a notification like you might get from a bank that says your fees are going up on this date. This is actually quite a strategic post that says, you know, we've been charging the price that we've been charging for a while now. And, um, and we are, because we've made such uh, big product developments between then and now, we're having to adjust the prices. So here's exactly what we've added to the product since you joined up or since we started charging 29 a month or whatever it is. Here's all of the features that you include within your product and service. But by the way, if you sign up before this date, you can get in at the current price. So that's just an yeah. absolute dream of a piece of content because you are informing people that the prices are going up. You're boosting exactly why the prices are going up because of all the extra resources and tools and things that you've, you've included these days. And also you're giving people a chance to sign up at the current price. And that for us has been the most, one of the most profitable uh, pieces of content we've ever created. It's just, just, it's just a gold mine. That's really good. It shortens the sales cycle. It pushes, you know, pushes them over the edge. They're kind of, you know, do I do it now? Do I do it later? Uh, exactly. Really, really smart. And I like that being able to, you know, make that invitation to buy at multiple points in the, the journey. And, and yeah. yeah, I read about that in, in my book. And, and that's one of my frustrations is I'll go and I'll, even if I want something, then, you know, I have to watch this long thing and go through, I've jumped through all these hoops and say, like, just let me buy the thing. I just want the thing. <laughs> Can I just buy yeah. it? And, mm -hmm. you know, but doing that in, in content is really, really smart because you're, you're walking them through the process and spending that time on education. But if we never give them the opportunity to say yes and just jump in now, that why would they? So I think it's exactly. really, really smart. Yeah. And it also allows you to get some organic stuff to that, to that page. So if you just send it out in an email, fine. Okay. That's going to get some sales. But if you actually publish this on your website, it has a certain weight 
because you are literally putting your words on the internet for anyone to be able to see. So this is my problem that I find, especially in the SaaS industry. A lot of the communication is very, very surface level on their blog, very like eight top tips to do this thing or this tool versus this tool, especially in the SaaS industry. But then the email is where you get that, oh, your prices are going up, by the way. And and, then, and the things that, you know, the product developments and things like that, it's all kind of internal and, and private. I just love to see more companies actually take that content that they say one-to-one or over the support tickets or, you know, yeah. over emails and actually just be honest and transparent and put it on the internet and put it as a, as a, as a post or an update to say, here's what's happening so that it's, uh, you know, potential to drive more organic traffic to your website so that you can share it on social media. You don't have to, with an email, how are you supposed to turn that into a social media post? There's creative ways that you can do it when you publish that original piece of content on your website first. You then take that and then repurpose it on social, repurpose it to your email, repurpose it in yeah. support tickets. Like you can send someone there, you can get traffic, it can get links. Like there's so much more that can come from it if you have that content first approach rather than communication down these strange little channels. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Instead of trying to, to hide it and keep it internal, make it, make it more public. And, and ultimately if you're, if the goal is to drive sales, that's where you want, you want it out there in, in the marketplace where people are going to see yeah. it. I, I think the reason they don't is they're afraid of what their competitors will do with it and yeah. probably an unreasonable mm-hmm. fear. Because if they're, yeah, if they're but, you know worth raising prices, if they're that good, then you know why bother? Your competitors are going to know anyway. Yeah, they are. They're always going to know. They're always doing comparison pieces. Of like course. a product, of a product, um, you know, project management tool isn't going to be able to be, exist without Monday.com doing a you know an alternatives post to their website. Like uh, people love like finding the competitors and shining a light on them. So you may as well be the company that to do that first. Right. Get your content out there. You know, people are going to find the, 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 the cracks in your armor. If you do one thing, um, you know, that your competitors do better, that's what the one thing they're going to talk about on their website when they're talking about comparison pieces and comparing their software to your software. So you may as well just be as open, honest and transparent as you possibly can so that you can collect all those keywords. You can collect the rankings. You can own the conversation. And you're not ever going to be able to own the conversation if everything's internal, if everything's on a PDF on the on the footer of your website. Like put as much content as you possibly can, publicly available, and you know have your have your competition fear that transparency because that's what we find when yes. we take on clients. We can guarantee that when we take on a client to write their content, that their competitors are not being as brave. They're not being as courageous with their content as we are with the client. And it shows because people, they just don't get it. They don't get this courageous kind of transparency that really does make a difference. Um, they're just following the same company that they they copied uh, with their content. Right. And then that someone else is copying them. And they, they end up in this, in this cycle of just doing the same thing. And that's why we really like to get brave and courageous with the content that we produce because it makes a big difference. Yes, yes. I love that. Brave and courageous. Yeah, you know, thinking about comparisons, I, I I too love when I see one of those, and I saw one a, a little while back, and it was the top ten solutions for uh, for a particular niche. And I'm reading down, and I always look to see, you know, which which company is it that's promoting it. And uh, and then I look, and you know, we've got this whole list of ten, and the company's website that's on, they're number ten. I'm like. You, you guys don't get how this works, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you made yourself yeah. number 10. What other mistakes do you see um, companies make in, in SEO or content? And uh, how do you address those? Yeah, I think um, there's usually a big, a big mistake that people make when it comes to content that we see is that, especially in the tech world, in SaaS specifically, is that they get looped into things like product updates. So I know we've just been speaking about being open, honest, and transparent, but the bulk of your content needs to genuinely be helpful. So for instance, if you do have um, a project management tool, you know, rather than saying here are the latest features that we've added one week and then the next week saying we've made a change in our business 
like we've hired a new CEO or we've got a new career, like this, a new careers page, like it just becomes a little bit too much about the company. So that's why we say sprinkle the, the content about your products and service in, but majority of your content should ideally be helpful, informative, long form content in order for you to be the expert in your niche. So one thing we like to say is if you want to be the authority and you want to own the conversation, then you need to have a very much a, a, a kind of a goal in mind that owns that conversation. So you are the most trusted voice in your industry so that you're publishing more content. It's more open, honest and transparent than ever before. Step away from seeing your blog and your content as, oh, this is just like a news section or like Mm. an update section. It's not. It does need to be completely informative and educational. And and it it just, it falls nicely when you're producing five really in-depth articles showing people how to solve a specific problem. You're going to get the rankings and the traffic to come with it. And then you use a little bit of sales content in order to get people to buy from you. Um, But you, you usually produce a lot more content to show Google that you are the expert in this niche and your website should be ranking on the first page of Google and people should be on your website consuming your content so that you can then point people to your product page and you can actually start talking about what you offer. And then when you've got leads and sales, you can use the sales content in order to email back to your list and get sales instantly. So that's usually how we do it. We kind of have like an 80-20 of 80% 80% would be really valuable, helpful, rankable, searchable uh, topics, and then maybe 20% in order for you to really get people to do the next step, take the next step. Here's what we would like you to do. Here's everything you need to know about our product. So that's kind of a basic overview of how we might map a content plan out. You, you, if your goal is traffic and rankings, then it might be more 90 and 10. You know, And that's why it's so important that you start with the goal in mind to begin with so that you can put together an action plan for that. Uh, But, you know, Google love original content. They love content that's not about products and services. And that's why you got to sprinkle it in sometimes. Uh, You you just see a lot of companies that just have a news section on their website or a more of a journal of who we are as a company. And we've just got a new office plant or a new office pet. Like, is it valuable? Is it going to help someone buy from you or educate them? Uh, and if it's not, really think about whether or not it's worth publishing that content. I like that. So you mentioned eight content pillars. Uh, what are mm-hmm. those? What are the eight? So the the eight pillars are so that you can attract your ideal clients. So when we first started our agency, we were attracting anyone and everyone because we were ranking for loads of keywords and we were getting loads of traffic and leads through our website. The problem was is we were not... Um, appealing to our ideal clients. So a lot of the conversations we were having, they weren't our ideal clients and they potentially were, we were spending too much time dealing with these inquiries. So we had another problem, which is we need to filter these out. So the eight pillars come from the term content fortress, which is the name of our book. And it's made up of these eight pillars. Yeah. And sales content's one of them. So it starts with repelling content content that repels your clients or potential clients who are not the right fit. Really important that you have some sort of a of a fortress in place so that you only appeal to your ideal clients. Adds a little bit more of a velvet rope kind of policy. So yeah. imagine that club, that exclusive restaurant, you know, there's a waiting list and that's what content can do. You can publish a series of pieces of content that allow you to be seen as an authority and it repels people who are just not right for you, who don't value your processes, your time, your expertise. We don't need those as clients, and repelling content can help you do that. On the flip side, you've got attracting content. So there may be people in your audience who don't feel like they can work with you right now for whatever reason. Maybe they think, oh, that tool doesn't apply to me, or that service isn't relevant right now. Right. So you can produce a series of articles or videos or podcasts to help educate people on, oh, by the way, did you know that we actually help corporate businesses with this problem as well? That's a great, if you've got like an enterprise plan that people don't know about, you know, that kind of thing can really direct people to different parts of your business that are extremely profitable from producing specific content that helps people understand more about your offering and how you can help people. 
Think about case studies. Case studies work really well in that section because you can articulate that this business did this thing with us and also it can help you. And that helps people um, understand that you can help them even if they initially thought that you couldn't. And then we've got uh, pricing content, which is all about how much it costs to hire your agency or how much it costs for you to, you know, build your own software, whatever it is that, you know, you do for people, be honest and transparent about how much it costs, how much people might pay if they do it themselves, how much it might cost if you've got an agency, all of the different elements that come with that is all about price. Then sales content, which we've spoken about, everything you need to know about our product and service, um, how you can work with us, all the different options available, be a little bit more transparent about the intricacies of it. Uh, so that's the fourth one. Then we have guiding content. So things you need to be aware of before you work with a content writing agency. Guiding them to make the right decision before they buy from you, which is guiding content. So how to hire the best software developer for you. Like give them an open and honest uh, account of what they need to do in order to make sure that they make the right buying decision. Rather than you say, you should only work with us because we're the best and everybody else is rubbish. Actually tell them, say, these are all the options available for you. We only want to work with people that are the right fit and un understandably not everybody's the right fit. So here are the alternative options if we're not, if you're not ready for us yet. So that would be guiding content. And the next one is process content. So process content is talking people through your exact process. So this works great in SaaS because usually people re rely on product demos and, you know, little, um, little smart tools that pop up that say, go here first and then go there next and then click on this page. It's a little bit frustrating. So we found that in a service business or in an agency business, it's much better if you can break down all of those steps that somebody might take when they work with you and how they might get the most from your product or service that you offer. So we actually, when we were building websites for clients, we actually had a 31 step process that said, here's exactly what we do from start to finish to make sure that we do the, the best possible job. That does two things. It keeps you aligned with the fact that you've got a process and you actually right. know where you need to be in the process. But it also keeps your client in line because when they say, actually, I want you to do this and I want you to do that and where are we up to? You've got that process nailed down so that they are aware and they stay within that process, which is vital for a content fortress. And then we have um, the last two, which is opinion content and culture content. So actually, one thing that we found works really, really well for SaaS founders, especially, is that they have an opinion online. They are tweeting their opinions. They're sharing their thoughts. They're talking about things that's going on right now in the uh, economy. And they're relating it back to their product and service. They're having opinions. They're not afraid to go up against people when they see something they disagree with. They they have an ideal scenario, and they they they're happy to talk about it. A lot of SaaS founders just bury themselves behind the tech and don't come out behind the logo. And uh, unfortunately, people don't get to know them, and they don't get any real cut through. So one of our clients is, he runs a SaaS business, but his personal brand is what he's well known for. So he's able to be out there, be himself, share his opinions online, and his SaaS business benefits from that, from that, uh, that broad kind of awareness that he's creating. And, um, it's okay to have an opinion. It's okay to get reactions. And some people might disagree with him sometimes, and some people will agree, but the engagement is there. And that means that when he goes to another company, you know, he can launch another product and another service because right. he's got an audience around him. So that personal brand element is something that a lot of SaaS businesses miss out on. But the same for agencies, you know, agencies don't do that. They hide behind the, the agency and the product and they don't get out from behind that, that, that logo. And then finally, culture content, which is all about the business and how you operate. So as an example, when we post a job on our, on our website and we say we're hiring right now, what does that look like? Does it look like exactly the same job description that anyone could apply for? Or have you got something different? Is your brand stand out enough that people will, you know, take note? So as a one thing that we do within our, within our businesses, whenever we sell, um, our book, we give a big percentage of that to a mental health charity because that's part of our culture and part of what the book's that. about, about protecting your business and protecting your mental health. And we also, when we apply, when we put job postings out there, 
we like to pay for every interview that we that we give so if someone applies for a job we say even if you don't get the job we'll pay you um well above market rate for an hour's pay just because we understand how much time effort and energy goes into applying for a job so the least we can do is that so i mean that's something small it's not like um you know just just a, a headline that's us saying to people that we care about the people who apply for our job and we we see benefits from that. We see people share that all the time. We see people share that we've got a book and we give to mental. Like it's what your culture is around your business. And actually, when you use content to help people understand why you do what you do, then that has a big impact. So those are the things that we do in our businesses to impact culture, but then actually publishing content about it and helping people, whether that's publishing a LinkedIn post or publishing a Twitter post about a latest charity donation or what you've done in your community, that gives an over overwhelming impression to how you differ from your competitors. So that'd be culture content. So those are the eight pillars, repelling content, attracting content, sales, uh, pricing content, sales content, guiding content, process content, opinion content, and uh, culture content. Very, very good. Uh, it's super, super helpful. I love how you break that down into different categories. And, you know, when we're putting together content calendars, a lot of times we're thinking about, like, specific topics, like, I'm going to write about sales, I'm going to write about marketing. But I think this is a different way to look at it. And mm. and you can have those those same topics, but address them in different ways. And so now you have a lot of variety in content, and so think about, well, if I'm going to write about sales, well, now I can do, I need some repelling content. I need some attracting yeah. content. I need, you know, all these things. How does that fit into culture? What is our culture like? Yeah. yeah. So I think it's really exactly. interesting. Yeah. And it's very, very tricky when it comes to sitting down and creating a piece of content or for a content team, or if it's just one person doing it, like, what do we post about this week? Right. And that's why we love, love frameworks. We love plans. We love templates. We love all that kind of stuff. So Um, We actually give like for each service that you have, if a company has three different services, they can produce five different pieces of content for one service, just for repelling content, like just one repelling piece for one service. And you've got three different services. There's a boatload of content ideas just for one pillar there. And then not forgetting about the other eight pillars. And, and, And don't forget that this content that we put in the book, Content Fortress, is only for attracting your ideal clients. So it means that every piece of content you publish is going to go towards an ideal client, not just a visitor to your website. And I think that's the like two, three levels deep. If you're just publishing content in order to get traffic to your website, then great, you know, just publish content and hope for the best. And that's good if you are using organic traffic as your number one goal in order to get funding or raising investment or whatever. Um, But for the most part you want ideal clients so that's just you know get traffic to your website and help educate them in in order to make sure that most of the people you have sales calls with go ahead and that's the point that we've got in our business now where we actually speak to clients and they're already committed to working with us because they've read our content they've seen our prices they understand our process everything's all freely available on our website so that by the time we do speak to clients they're just ready to just you know, go ahead, uh, which means we don't spend time doing proposals. We don't spend time spending two hour sales calls and then a boatload of emails after it. It's just nice and seamless. We just let Mm. our content do the heavy lifting. Yeah. Yeah, Does organic still work? Uh, There's some controversy about that of no, it has to be paid and organic is suppressed now. Does organic content still work? Yeah. So we've found with our clients that Organic content is the way for you to get long lasting results, obviously, because when you stop paying for ads, you stop getting the traction. But if you need, if you need free trials, if you need sales right now, or you need a a free, you know, uh, whatever your model is, you can get sales right now through ads. However, one of our uh, clients recently has transitioned from producing ads to get people to sign up to free trials and they now use they're now using ads to get people to free content so it's really interesting actually so we produce all their blog content and they are they are using ads to get people to read that content so it's kind of really like backwards for a lot of people 
which is when we spent that time going in and creating that piece of content. And that's not just organic written content, that's organic video content as well. If they're shooting videos and they want to educate people, they're using ads to get people to the educational content because they found that when you pitch an ad on Facebook or on Google to go to a free trial or to sign straight up to the product that these people might sign up there, but they might drop off a lot sooner. When you send someone to education using PPC to education and to inform them about why it works, not just this works, then you usually keep that client for a lot longer and that customer for a lot longer. They're also more educated. They're going to get results sooner because you're informing them that there is a specific way that it should be done. So both would be great. But if you are thinking about paid versus organic, we found that even when we've got companies who are paying for paid, they're still sending them to the traffic, the the, the organic helpful content, uh, because that's what generates a more long lasting relationship with a client when you're helping them and you're educating them. Um, it's more like, I suppose, the uh, teach a man to fish analogy, right? Uh, rather right. than you know. <laughs> so we we do find that it works well. In terms of uh, Google, Google's still the most you know the number one website in the world, no matter who else is out there. So there's still people are still going online and searching for questions and concerns and problems. So that's why you know we're very much safe in the content uh, channel that we use and yeah. we we help people with because. That's what ranks on Google. That's what gets traffic. That's what get link. That's what get links. That's what people look at when it comes to raising investment. You know, angel investors, what's your organic traffic? You know, um, that's a question they all ask. What's your email list? And we found that having a big email list is directly uh, related to the content that you're putting out. If you're trying to grow an email list and get potential clients or use that as a as a le- as a lever for raising investment then you're going to have to have a lot of content and it's going to have to help people and educate people so that you can ask them to sign up to your email list so that then you can grow the email list. Um, and, and that's the reality is that people will be more invested if they have spent some time consuming some content, if they feel like they've learned something, if they've got a little bit of dopamine versus I've just seen an ad, now I've clicked a link and now I'm going here and I was about to make a coffee and somewhere I've got lost and I've clicked all this stuff that popped up in my newsfeed. It's clear to see why organic performs differently, I will say. you know, I'm sure lots of ad agencies would argue with me that ads is all you need. But as soon as you switch that off, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to lose traction. And that's why it's a good idea to have both for different things. And, and why I would never advise my clients to not use ads if they've got the budget for it. Even better, if they can get people to the content that does the education and does build up that trust and know, like, and trust element using right. organic content, whether it's video written content, even a podcast. You know, there's so much value in these channels. Why would you not use ads to get people to consume this content? It just so happens when you switch off the ads, if you've got the content, you should have the traffic and the rankings that, that Google will give you for putting more of an emphasis on that channel. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, I really like that mix. As I, I do think it, it takes both, kind of depends on what the, the goals are. How do you measure success of content and you know, content marketing campaigns besides traditional metrics like traffic or conversions? What I've found is that the content And this is why it's so good that we spoke about the content fortress. So traffic to your website um, and rankings is the thing that people jump on usually. They're like, I just want, because I can validate that this works when I see the traffic and the rankings. But actually, it's it's further within the business that sees the biggest benefit from content. Hmm. So we've had the support and the sales people use our content so much more than yeah. you know than they thought that they were going to do because it's like somebody's asked a question about this product great i'll take the everything you need to know about this product post and i'll send it to them you know that means i don't have to explain everything because there's already a piece of content there um you know that would be great for a salesperson um or if someone says if we put together a, a, a tutorial in a written content and a support team member gets this question then they've got that content that they can use within their business that means that they're not dealing with inquiries for too long. That means that the salespeople have got assets. It's all about assets when it comes to getting sales. 
This is why people say, I love case studies. Yeah, well, you've got case studies as one way to create an asset in order to help you sell more products or services. Uh, but what else have you got? And that's where some blog content can come into the mix. That's where some video content can come into the mix. So it really is um, the team and the energy and the effort that it takes to get customers is a lot lower. And the effort it takes to retain clients is a lot lower as well because the content is doing so much in the way of, wow, like every week we're getting informed and educated. You can genuinely see that this company cares because of how much content they're pumping out. Mm. And I do think that that energy and effort is not about, you know, it might initially be, oh, we just want more traffic and rankings. But, I, you know, we take clients on for that. And then before long, they're like, I really love how this helped this person solve this problem in our business and how we're able to send this off to someone. And it took us two seconds, whereas before it would have taken us 10 minutes to get to this. So it does have so many other things. And I think it comes back to having a good culture, understanding why you're doing this is to help people inform, you know, educate themselves, even if they never use your product or service. How can I give more to the Internet? How can I be the most trusted piece of content or trusted answer to this question and when you have very much a like do we own the conversation online on this topic approach then you're never going to stop you're never going to stop wanting to level up you're always going to be wanting to come up with new ideas for your content and uh, and your com- competition do not think like this i've never met a client that that really understood the value of content without me having to explain it like this which is own yeah. the conversation own the conversation and then you can own the sales on the back of it because people will trust you and they'll take your word for it. They'll pay more for your products and services if they trust you. They'll stick around for longer if they trust you. And that's what content can do that ads really, really can't. And that's really smart. And you're essentially saying, you know, capture the mind and the the, the payment will follow. Because it's exactly. you're, you're really giving them what they need in order to feel really mm-hmm. good about making that purchase decision. And they have that affinity Absolutely. because you're the one that, that took the time and, and gave them that education. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's just an, an enjoyable thing to do, you know, provide more value and just see the rewards. You know, like, I love explaining things. That's why I love being interviewed on podcasts because you get asked questions and you get to explain it in as much depth as you like and uh, with as much clarity as you like. That's all we're doing on the internet. We're just providing content, whether that's in a video course whether that's in a one minute reel, you're answering a question, whether that's in a 3000 word blog post, let's just explain things more clearly. Nobody's going to complain if you do that. Love that. Love that. So let's say you were going to start an entirely new SaaS business today. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what unconventional marketing tactics would you consider using? It's funny, actually, because we've just been uh, part of an angel, um, pitch for a new SaaS business is that, that, you know, they they want to work with us as well. So it's quite interesting, actually. So the thing that I would probably say with a brand new SaaS business is forget about the immediate sales in a way that, you know, do a launch, do all that stuff, but really, really just focus on trying to educate people. So it feels like a lot of what I've been saying on this on this show, but yeah, like what you just said, which is the sales will come, the sales will follow if you have an education mindset. Now, things like we've got a new SaaS tool, great, here are all the product features and here's everything. But I do think that being the most trusted voice and the most committed to education is a way to get cut through. And what we've found is the best way to do that is from having a personal brand. So when you decide to put content out and be educational, you get much more cut through if you are a person leading that conversation. So rather than your website owning the conversation, if you can be the person on Twitter or on LinkedIn that really is out there being honest and transparent about what it is that you're doing and using content to elevate the business on the back end, then that is something that I don't see a lot of SaaS businesses do. There's a few standout examples of, CEOs, um, you know, um, like Buffer, Joel at Buffer, for instance, he's someone that has a strong personal brand. You've got Nathan Barry at ConvertKit. He's out there. But there's, there's, there's 
loads of SaaS, most of the SaaS businesses out there do not step out and be the personal brand in their organization. Mm. They might tweet yeah. a couple of times a week, maybe a couple of times a month, but they haven't got their their content nailed down. They don't have a full content plan. And, uh, and I think it's really important because when the website does publish content, whether that be, you know, case studies or blog posts or video courses, if you're trying to rely solely on your website and Google to get traction, then you might be waiting a long time. Whereas if you step out and you are the voice of the business, and there's nothing to say that this business has to be attached to you and you can't sell it in the future, that's known to be false. You know, people sell businesses all the time. So if you are stepping out and you are the expert on CRMs and your tool is a CRM and you're constantly coming up with ideas about, it frustrates me that the CRM world does this thing. Here's what we're trying to do to fix it. Get out there, share that content with your audience. If you've got a personal brand and you've got lots of people on Twitter following you or LinkedIn, the website publishes the content, but you, then you distribute that content. You distribute it in your emails. You distribute it on LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever you are on threads and you get far more cut through as a personal brand rather than a, just a faceless logo. So that's something that we see that I'd really, really like SaaS businesses to improve is have a strong leader within that company who's prepared to do a lot of the promotion for it. Uh, and it doesn't have to be you, but there has to be a face. And usually that face is the CEO or the CMO or someone like that in order to spread the message far and wide and put a person behind the software. I think it's super valuable, super important, and you'll just get more traction within your content. So then when you do all of the, the regular things like the organic content, like the Facebook ads, you can start to use that person a little bit more because people know them, they like them, they trust them. And as long as you use the content pillars, you talk about the fact that you're increasing your price soon and you want people to get in, you talk about your opinion, you talk about the culture and your hiring process. And before you know it, you you, you tap in on all those eight pillars of the content fortress. You're just using your personal brand to get that in front of people uh, so that you're not completely relying on Facebook ads and organic traffic. That is fantastic advice. Well, where can we learn more about you, about Dan? Let me try that again. Where can we learn more about you, about Jammy Digital and the book? So you can go to jammydigital.com. Um, that's our website, our agency website, or you can search for Martin Huntsbach on LinkedIn or Twitter, and um, you can get Content Fortress uh, for free, actually, if you send me an email. So we've actually put together a Content Fortress mini course along with a free PDF copy of the book. If you just send me an email at martin at jammydigital.com, I'll send you a link to that. Um, you don't have to pay anything for it, but you can get the book on Amazon and Kindle if you really want. Just search for Content Fortress. Outstanding. Yeah, definitely send over a, an email and get the, the book and the, the course from Martin. Martin, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for being on SAS Fuel. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again, Martin, for coming on the show and sharing your insights and resources. Be sure to check out that article for content at different stages of the buyer journey. We'll link it in the show notes and definitely pick up a copy of their book, Content Fortress. I've been through it a couple of times and actually listened to this episode several times, thinking about that framework that Martin laid out. You can learn more about Martin Lindsay and Jammy Digital at jammydigital.com. As always, all links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. And check us out on YouTube as well. Lots of cool stuff there. Like, subscribe, say hi, follow us, or just let us know that you're out there. The team loves to hear from people, and I do as well. Everyone who subscribes this week gets a trending SaaS app. It's called TongTap, the flavor profile app that no one needs. Just point it at any food, and it'll tell you what it tastes like. Spoiler alert, it's always going to say it tastes like chicken. But join us next Tuesday, where our founder is Omar Jordan. He is the founder and CEO of Coviance, formerly Lender Close. They are a fintech company that is making the home equity lending process simpler, faster, and more scalable via SaaS. Really insightful conversation on bringing a legacy industry into the 21st century and adopting technology. It's pretty, pretty cool. And next week on our SaaS Fuel Expert Series, we have best-selling author, endurance, and strongman competitor, and founder of Smarter Commerce, Smarter Marketing, Jason Criddle. 
to talk about SaaS investing, sales, and marketing. So I will see you next time. And as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SaaS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.